Uh, so let me see. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this uh, afternoon's uh, Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative City Pioneers uh, seminar series. Uh, today, I am very honored to introduce our speaker, Professor Erwin Viray, uh, who was uh, the immediate past head of pillar for our architecture and sustainable design uh, in, in SUTD. And he is now spearheading our sustainability initiative in SUTD as our chief sustainability officer. So uh, <clears throat> Erwin is going to talk to us about uh, how design is important in uh, creating your personalized sustainable future. And he tells me that he's going to showcase uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, examples on how that is uh, occurring in real life. So without further ado, uh, I shall pass uh, the time to Erwin. And uh, I remind everyone that uh, today's seminar is actually recorded. Thank you. Erwin, over to you. Uh, thank you, Harvey. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, and also thank you everyone. Welcome today uh, for joining us in this uh, webinar. Uh, we will be sharing with you something fundamental to the identity of SUTD and the profession of architecture, the aspiration to make a better world through the application of science, technology, and the audacious and determined application of design intelligence. The aspiration to make our environment to be not only more sustainable, but more beautiful and enjoyable is not a new endeavor. The bubonic plague uh, swept through Milan in the 1480s. A young engineer and artist named Leonardo da Vinci took it upon himself to redesign the city to make it possible to more safely carry out daily life. Not only did he look at spatially segregating ill and recovering patients, but he also took steps to separate different forms of traffic and water waste in the city. These sketches are preserved for us today in the Paris manuscripts. Uh, it is what we see on the screen. We see a vision for a three-dimensional city, underground network of water waste conveys fresh and soiled water in and out of the city and serve as a form of transport. A multi-layered city above ground separated pedestrian traffic along colonnaded upper walkways from the faster transport at ground level. Higher levels become spaces for living and at the highest levels are left as open and flat roofs. Oops. Almost like the sky parks in Singapore today. So, uh, the next slide is actually something uh, that in 1967, a newly formed country found itself in a state of emergency. A growing population was relying on dilapidated housing stock and without modern means of transport to allow access to much of the city. Of course, this is Singapore. Two young architects addressed these challenges with an audacious sense of purpose, envisioning a highly dense and three-dimensional Singapore populated high above ground and VC many levels below ground. Transport was woven at multiple layers, creating scenes of social interaction across levels. The vision took the challenge of congestion and transformed it into an asset, an engine for a productive, modern, healthy, and culturally and socially vibrant country. So today we face uh, compounding global challenges, perhaps the most daunting of which is climate change. The United Nations Secretary General has made it abundantly clear in the past year when he described the latest scientific report of climate change as a cold red for humanity. Urgent action is needed not only to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, but also to prepare ourselves for the effects of a changing climate. Something must be done, but many of us feel uncertain. What can we do in the face of such a large problem? How can any one person make possible a difference? And so we look at this uh, 
diagram. And it is both inspiring and daunting to know that architects, city planners, civil engineers, building scientists collectively have the greatest potential both to reduce emissions of greenhouses, green gases, yeah, greenhouse gases. This graph shows why. Together, the operation and construction of buildings accounts for about 40% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. This includes what is called operational emissions generated when heating, cooling, lighting, and providing electricity to buildings. And embodied emissions, those generated when manufacturing and assembling building materials like concrete and steel. This responsibility is great, but so also is the potential. It implies that the built environment will radically change in the next 20 years, resulting in a world that may be barely recognizable by today's eyes. It would be a transformation equivalent to the change that happened during the foundational decades of Singapore. Singapore has stepped forward to commit to net zero emissions by mid-century as part of the Green Plan announced last year. This is a massive commitment that ensures significant change to the built environment. The plan provides some clues to what this will involve. Uh, solar capacity must be greatly increased. Buildings will consume much less electricity. Buildings will also become more productive. The site for new urban farms. At the same time, the Green Plan also asks for input from industry and citizens. Net zero can come sooner if there is a strong support and intelligent ideas. At SUTD, we have also launched our first coordinated sustainability plan, formalizing our efforts after many years of contributions. The SUTD sustainability plan addresses our contributions to research for greener solutions, education for green careers and lifestyle, and also takes on our campus, committing to reduce consumption and waste in proportion with the national plan. But of course, we also aspire to push farther and faster with the goal of net zero emissions as our target. Working toward net zero at a small scale of our campus, we already see some of the challenges faced at a wider scale throughout Singapore and by other dense cities throughout the world. First is the fact that we are married to our existing infrastructure. The SUTD campus is almost brand new and as it is designed, it is the most efficient university campus in Singapore. We have the advantage of having entirely new buildings, but with these new buildings, we have to push much harder to achieve efficiency gains. But of course, we must work with what we have because the carbon cost is already sunk in this building. So instead of starting a new, we must push what we have much further. The path to full net zero would require radical change, reducing our reliance on air-conditioned spaces, but also greatly expanding our uses of renewables. This brings us to a second challenge we face at SUTD and which all of Singapore faces. Even though solar energy is the most viable option for carbon neutral electricity, it requires very, very, very large surface areas. The denser the city, the more surface areas needed. And Singapore is in the challenging position of being among the densest urban environments in the world and simultaneously one of the most space constrained of all countries. If we think two dimensionally, the problem is simply not solvable. But perhaps if we are able to design in three dimensions at the same time as we improve efficiency, we can move the bar further toward net zero. In the case of SUTD, uh, a simple calculation can tell us that if we cover 80% of the area of our campus, including uh, currently reserved areas in photovoltaics, we would be able to fulfill all of our energy needs. This is a very difficult problem to resolve requiring accommodation of the existing buildings and land uses, but it is also not an impossible problem. It does, however, require audacious thinking, mastery of the design of the built environment and deep understanding of the building technologies. Our architecture and sustainable design program at SUTD is dedicated to developing among our students this combination of audacity, mastery of design and understanding of technology. 
The Master of Architecture program in particular provides an opportunity for students to build on their design and technology foundation to develop a far-reaching vision. Similar to the early work of Taking Soon and William Lim in Singapore of the 1960s, or the young Leonardo da Vinci in Milan of the 1480s, the master's program thesis provides students with a platform for launching their career trajectory. So uh, you can see some of these uh, possibilities by uh, looking at the projects that we do in the program. In the master's program, each student develops his or her individual area of thesis research in one-on-one -on -one consultation with the faculty men mentor working in a similar area. The thesis is an opportunity to test the ideas they would like to implement during their careers, a moment to acquire deeper mastery of, of certain technical ideas, and ultimately showcase their accomplishments locally and internationally. Sustainability is an integral part of the MARC thesis program. It informs our initial discussions in the introduction to research seminar in the first academic term of the program. It is also the subject of workshops and lectures we hold with international architects during the course of the program in 2021. Uh, Professor John Hong of uh, Seoul National University joined us for a lecture on sustainability in the post-Anthropocene and a workshop where he met students individually and discussed their thesis topics with them. We return to sustainability at the end of the thesis as well. In the second academic term of the MR program, students uh, focus on completing the thesis projects. As the culmination of this process, we hold an exhibition and series of dialogues. The theme of the 2021 exhibition was sustainability futures, challenging each student to articulate the goals of the thesis projects in the terms of sustainable development and building from the UN's sustainable development goals. For the final exhibition, distinguished local and international guest jurors come to award prizes for the most accomplished projects. Professor Hong was able to return for this event last year to see some of the projects he had first looked at six months earlier. He was joined in the jury by Sio Mang Kok of MKPL Architects in Singapore and Sasha Gassel of Amsterdam Space and Matter. The dialogue helped open our eyes to the ways others in the world are working on sustainability and challenges and opportunities that are shared between North and South, East and West. If you would like to see the student work from this final exhibition, you can follow the link included here. I will share with you now a few MR thesis projects from the exhibit that reflect a particular effort by the student to imagine a more sustainable future. Our first project is by Lester Lim. In the exhibition website, it is grouped under sustainable development goal number 11, uh, sustainable cities and communities and located in the city of Detroit in the United States. So uh, Lester CC seeks to redefine the American dream of suburbia by readapting the Derry Lake Packard automobile plant into a suburb of the future. It draws on themes of industrial manufacturing and home ownership, which have become inherent to destroy Detroit's many problems. So uh, it is set in a future where electric and autonomous vehicles are the norm. This new suburb seeks to integrate spaces for cars and humans, as well as redefine architectural mobility and autonomy. Our next project addresses sustainable development goal number 17, Partnerships for the Goals, which focuses on promoting the development, transfer, dissemination, and diffusion of environmentally sound technologies to developing countries on favorable terms. This project is by Benedict Tan. It is titled to Mother Earth Planetary Governance Through the Permafrost. Permafrost is any ground that remains completely frozen, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees centigrade, or colder for at least two years straight. These permanently frozen grounds are most common in regions with high mountains and in the Earth's higher altitudes near the North and South Poles. Permafrost plays an essential role in the Arctic ecosystem by making the ground watertight and maintaining the vast network of wetlands taken across the Arctic tundra 
that provide habitat to animals and plants. So uh, this project, as mentioned, is cited in the Arctic Sea in the near future and addresses how it may become possible to live sustainably in the rapidly changing climate. The project seeks to redefine what it means to be sustainable through the management of the many natural resources of the far north, combining investigation of energy generation with growing need for data storage and cloud computing, ideas of hyperintelligence and pla planetary governance are introduced as new forms of understanding the nature that we inhabit. Our next project addresses the sustainable design goal, uh, goals of number 11, sustainable cities and communities by designing sustainable housing manufactured with robotics from a soil-based material in Kakuma, Kenya. At a time when human disturbance to the environment is challenging livability to the, on the planet, it is important to find sustainable construction methods that engages with the liveliness of the movement of people in and out of cities. This thesis investigates the viability of implementing digitally fabricated architecture as a solution to urban sprawl of refugee camps, focusing on local materials that can feed into the development of a circular economic model for building constructions within the city. The next project I would like to share with you takes on sustainable development goal number 13, climate action, which covers urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. The student Janina Sedler has worked with SUTD engineers to design a means of deploying new carbon negative material they have created called C3. Janina's project proposes a series of lattice towers placed along Singapore's coast that possibly draw CO2 from the atmosphere using only the power of the wind and the properties of the C3 material developed by the engineers from SUTD. The form of the tower is designed to interact optimally with the prevailing winds along Singapore's southern coast. For the purposes of CO2 harvesting, she proposes sequestering the CO2 captured by the tower in the biomass of plants and interior greenhouses. Sustainable development goal number nine on industry, innovation, and infrastructure is addressed by the next thesis project, aiming to build resilient infrastructure, promote sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation. Tet Nong O's thesis titled Bites and Man, Urban Data Centers of Singapore has combined a sustainable data center serving Singapore's fintech sector near the CBD with social functions that can grow the vibrancy of the Marina Bay area. The thesis aims to investigate architectural systems and tectonics that addresses the thermodynamic implications of urban data on human experience. For example, by using excess, excess heat from the data storage to power social programs like the food center shown in this section. Nang O explores heat energy utilization in the context of Singapore in order to propose a heat neutralism framework where excess industrial heat is treated as a reusable energy resource instead of a discarded waste product. The project imagines functional and architectural potential of on top energy sources from data centers. A final project by Benjamin Chong addresses the sustainable design, sustainable development goals number 12, uh, responsible consumption and production. This thesis is titled Agropolis, Imagining, Reimagining Urban Food Security and is located here in Singapore. Uh, Ben's thesis repurposes Singapore's HDB multi-story car parks as a productive social food hubs. Grounded in addressing the Singapore Food Agency's 30 by 30 goal, it highlights opportunities from the Urban Redevelopment Authority's car light initiatives using computational and parametric design to reinterpret urban agriculture production in land scars, Singapore. The design also envisioned a scalable and modular prototype for other urban cities around the world. 
it attaches to the existing parking structure with minimal changes, adding extra space for urban farming above the structure and adopting several of the parking levels for social space and service space for the urban farms. Benjamin has calculated that only 51 car parks modified in this way would be adequate to fully supply Singapore's need for leafy greens by 2030. There is much more information on these projects and many others from our class of 2021 and 2020 on out our grad show website. To find out more about the curriculum and admission requirements for the SUTD Master of Architecture program, you can browse the site. Finally, please stay at the updated to learn more about our students and their amazing work by following our Instagram page. You can reach us with any questions at our email address, asd at sutd.edusg. I would like to express my thanks also for the uh, great help of my colleague, uh, Dr. Peter Ordner, who is the director of our Masters of Architecture program, who has helped uh, create this presentation that we share with you today. Thank you for joining me to discover how our students are designing their visions for a sustainable future. I hope we can connect with you soon and empower more of our young people to make a better, sustainable, happier world by design. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Owen. Um, we have uh, lots of time for discussion and questions. So if, if you like, uh, you can either uh, type your question directly into the chat box or if you raise your hand, um, your virtual hand, I will be able to uh, uh, see, uh, see you and, and call your name. So uh, either way, it's good. Chat box or, you know, to raise your hand. Let me look at the uh, full screen. Okay. <clears throat> so while you are thinking about your question, maybe I will start off with, uh, a, a question, and I think it's, it's something that uh, I get asked, even though I do not know the answer, which is, um, is there a, a particular kind of student that will excel in, in uh, doing something as such, you know, combining design and architecture uh, to, to build a, a, a visions of sustainability? What kind of uh, person will, will thrive and enjoy in this, this kinds of work? Uh, Harvey, it's a very difficult question. I also <laughs> don't know the answer. Uh, but seriously, I think that the main purpose of maybe uh, the university is to open that uh, opportunity to provide a platform mm -hmm. for everyone, for every individual student to actually discover who they are and mm -hmm. discover what they like and what mm -hmm. they want to do. Mm -hmm. And by uh, discovering this, I think that they would be able to create themselves every day. So it is not actually um, finding yourself, but actually building yourself, creating yourself every day. And so mm -hmm. the exercises that are being given in the university, I think, uh, opens that uh, possibility for them to actually create themselves. So you choose what you want to do, and then you uh, mm -hmm. explore that. And then with the tools and, and, and skills and technology that is being provided by mm -hmm. the university and the conversations that you have with your mm. cohort mates, your schoolmates, and then also with the mentors, the tutors. I think uh, that helps form something mm. that helps you build yourself. Mm. And so I think it's that curiosity, I think, uh, mm. in the student that is maybe also important in as a quality that we mm. have to maybe uh, encourage in them. And, and so I think anyone can actually become uh, what you want, uh, mm -hmm. as long as you build yourself and then, mm -hmm. then you create yourself. So every day is actually not really searching for yourself, mm -hmm. but actually building yourself to maybe uh, reach something that you want to reach or achieve. And, and if you think that, okay, maybe you succeed, succeeded, maybe it's also good. And then you try to find if you can do further, mm -hmm. but if you don't also succeed, you can always try and then start again. So I, I think that is the whole part of being in the university. It also opens that uh, opportunity for conversations, as I mentioned, with the cohort mates, with your schoolmates, with mm -hmm. the uh, mentors, the tutors, but mm -hmm. also outside because of the nature of SUTD in the mm -hmm. programs that we have. We have many real world mm -hmm. problems 
and these are brought by our industry partners. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the community also brings problems. And so we try to find solutions mm -hmm. to them. And then in finding the solutions that could actually mm -hmm. help maybe make a better world, a happier mm -hmm. world, then we find uh, all these possibilities and we create these things that maybe uh, really help contribute to make that sustainable mm -hmm. and happier world mm -hmm. that we hope we would have. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> So so if if I, I may just uh yeah ne so next time I know what to say you know it's it's basically as what you say uh to have a curious mind and to be in the right environment that can fully realize this potential this curiosity that you have I think that's great we have a couple of more questions coming up um uh the first question is uh this is about uh, the masters of architectural program uh the a uh, person was asking whether it's only uh, drawing students directly from the undergraduate undergraduate program or can mid-career architects join this Master of Architecture program at SUTD? Okay, uh, yes. Uh, one of the special and distinct qualities of the program in SUTD is, uh, is it's a through program, uh, mm. meaning that people who come in as undergraduate students can actually uh, mm. uh, go to the master's program. So they complete the five-year requirement mm. of the, the Board of Architects. And in between mm. the undergraduate and the master's level, you have the in structured internship. So mm. the students go to an internship and so they experience what it is to be in the profession. And so they get to learn more and then mm. maybe uh, uh, have problems that they think they could solve. And then they work on these in their mm. thesis uh, mm. projects in the master's uh, mm. courses. Uh, we have accepted also uh, students from outside since about two years ago, we were mm -hmm. allowed to accept uh, students from uh, other universities outside of SUTD. Mm -hmm. uh, we have accepted some students from NUS also because they felt that they wanted to also uh, experience uh, mm -hmm. being in SUTD because of the programs we mm -hmm. offer, uh, maybe related to the computational uh, capabilities and the digital uh, mm -hmm. realm that we are exploring in SUTD. Um, and, and so I think that that is one of the draws why they want to do it. Yeah. And of course, in, in accepting these students, uh, there, we follow the guidelines and the rules provided to us by MOE mm -hmm. because we have this in-flight, out-flight uh, students. We have to take into consideration the numbers uh, of students that we can take in, mm -hmm. uh, which also is guided by the Board of Architects of Singapore. Mm -hmm. And uh, besides that also, we try to look at the the qualifications of the students, the mm -hmm. things that they bring. And then we try to see if they would actually uh, need some help maybe in adjusting and mm -hmm. learning about the culture of being in SUTD mm -hmm. because there is a certain culture and, and distinctive uh, way the students in SUTD behave. Mm -hmm. And there are also certain skill sets that they would mm -hmm. have uh, with them, which mm -hmm. is uh, the computation and the digital capability. Mm -hmm. So for the students who need this, we try to also provide the opportunity to help them uh, uh, mm -hmm. have this uh, thing so that they could actually join the students who are coming from SUTD uh, mm -hmm. and do their master's uh, mm -hmm. program uh, modules mm -hmm. and then the projects and then mm -hmm. pursue the interest that they have. Mm -hmm. if, if I were... Uh, um, here it says that if I, I've been working for a few years as an architect, can I join as a mid-career person to this master uh, of, of architecture program? So I'm not directly out of a uh, 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 basic degree in NUS or you know, NTU or whatever. I've been working for a couple of years. Can I join? Yes, uh, um, most welcome. We, <laughs> okay. in, in the recent exercises also, we have accepted uh, some uh, uh, some applicants who mm. have been working for quite some time mm. uh, outside and so they have the experience. And so because of that, uh, we look and examine also how their experience of working would contribute maybe to uh, satisfying the requirements for the structured internship. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we try to, to find ways also to help them and, and to, use, to help them use their time wisely and, and learn uh, mm. optimally when they join us here in SUTD. Mm. So we welcome everyone. Uh, we, of course, have to look carefully of the intentions they want and then the things that they want to do mm. and then the qualifications that they have had so far. And then from there, try to help and see what possibilities we can do together. Mm. Okay. 
Thank you. There's a second question, which is um, uh, what sustainability curriculum exists in SUTD outside of the master's program that you just highlighted earlier? And maybe I follow up a little bit on this question as well. Uh, what are the plans to you know, uh, include uh, sustainability ideas into the overall uh, education program in SUTD? Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, actually, we're working on this. It's part of the whole uh, structure of the sustainability plan of SUTD. As maybe when, when you look at all those hexagons, the beehive, you have the three components, which is research, uh, uh, supporting and encouraging research for green solutions. And then education itself having uh, sustainability is one big part of the education itself. And then of course, using our campus as the oasis, the open arena for sustainable uh, innovation and solutions. So, so we use the campus as the living laboratory itself for doing uh, the sustainability uh, uh, activities and explorations. So in terms of the curriculum, we actually have about more than 30 courses. Uh, we are sometimes not very conscious of it. But the, all the pillars actually have courses that have sustainability in them. Uh, so at the moment, um, as part of the task for the sustainability plan committee, we are working with the education department of SUTD to actually strengthen this and then make it more apparent to everyone. So there are about, uh, I think the, the last time we counted, there are about 20, more than 20 courses uh, uh, distributed across the pillars and the clusters mm -hmm. that actually deal with sustainability. Mm -hmm. And we could also uh, see how much uh, percentage is actually uh, uh, given to the subject of sustainability in these mm -hmm. courses. So, but I think that one thing more that I think that we have to be working on and we are working on at the moment is encouraging that leadership in sustainability itself. And so it's not only that, okay, you learn sustainability, it's just like this, but and, and you just measure it with the numbers that you have that it's 60%, 50% mm -hmm. or this or that, but actually it's more of the qualitative quality into mm -hmm. sustainability. It's actually assuming a sustainable behavior because sustainability will not be possible unless we behave sustainably. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it starts from the individual. So I think mm -hmm. that maybe the way we conduct our courses would reinforce this much mm -hmm. stronger in mm -hmm. many ways. Of course, mm -hmm. the architecture sustainable design pillar also um, uh, has to take a sort of a big role in this because if you look at it, mm -hmm. the name of the pillar is architecture and sustainable mm -hmm. design. And so we really have to uh, mm -hmm. take the bull by the mm -hmm. horn and then say, okay, this sustainability, what mm -hmm. is it? And so what can we do with sustainability? So I think that the studio programs and then the course modules in the architecture uh, programs also, you can see that there are many that deal mm -hmm. with sustainability, like the carbon mm -hmm. zero buildings, the mm -hmm. energy uh, of, of, of the environment. Mm -hmm. So there are modules specifically for these. And then mm -hmm. we have also studios that actually explore not only uh, things that are happening within SUTD, but also beyond SUTD with certain partners, mm -hmm. like even uh, uh, that, that we have uh, mm -hmm. collaboration in terms of research and then also education. Mm -hmm. and of course, that in the works at the moment also is the, the implementation of the uh, SUTD Sustainability Opportunities Program, SSOP, uh, mm -hmm. um, which is almost similar to the uh, University Research Opportunity Program. So in, in this uh, program, I think it will encourage students to actually do uh, sustainability uh, questions and then also mm -hmm. find the answers to this sustainability and the university mm -hmm. will be supporting them to find the answers to these. Mm -hmm. um, one of the examples, this was not yet the sustainability opportunity program, but it was actually in the university research opportunity program. Mm -hmm. uh, when um, we had the pandemic and then there were problems about the way the air was actually uh, maintained inside the workers dormitory and then even within our university uh, a group of students actually went to uh, seek the guidance of our uh, colleagues in the faculty who are working on this how to develop a clean air and then uh, in encourage 
good air circulation so that you maintain a healthy space. So I think this is a fun part of that sustainable activity that happens. So these were actually freshmen, first year students who did this. I think that was also very admirable. Mm -hmm. So besides that also, we're trying to imagine the possibility of offering a sustainability minor. And then so we're checking with the, the, the with the, with the pillars actually to how to, to put this uh, together. And, and because of the existing courses and the existing programs that we have, I, I think that you can imagine actually highlighting that, okay, we are actually doing the sustainable uh, capabilities. And so it is one way to maybe uh, encourage that sustainability mm -hmm. leadership through the education mm -hmm. and also uh, maybe awakening an interest and a consciousness and awareness mm -hmm in the young students about the possibilities of uh, sustainability. Mm. And maybe um, one could also share that in the SUTD sustainability plan, we have the sustainability committee that actually works on looking after the implementation of the sustainability plan of SUTD. And that group is almost has about 30 members. And then it's actually across all the pillars and then the classes are represented the administrative uh, departments are represented and the students are also represented. The student groups are very much represented. And you can see that like, for example, Greenprint, they have many activities that uh, encourage and actually do uh, sustainability. Like for example, they sponsored the sustainability design innovation hack mm -hmm. and then uh, other activities that reach out to the community, like the activities we have and collaboration with the Northwest CDC for the Green Library. And then even the organization of the forum that deal with uh, uh, sustainability. So mm -hmm. I think that there is something active in it. So there is something institutional in the infrastructure of the curriculum that is being actually worked on so that the program would make a more robust and very uh, active uh, sustainability content in the curriculum mm -hmm. and, and maybe encourage our colleagues much more to actually speak about it because sometimes we're so shy to speak about okay we're actually mm -hmm. doing this as a sustainability mm -hmm. and also offer the opportunity to actually explore and then maybe uh, discuss what is sustainability and are we doing it well are we not doing it well and if we're not mm -hmm. doing it well how can we do it better so mm -hmm. i think that there are opportunities that are actually happening now uh, because of the uh, i guess it's many people's desire to mm -hmm build that sustainable world, the mm -hmm. students, the administrators, and then the faculty also. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see there are some other questions about the curriculum of NCTD, but I, I want to uh, move away from that. And if we have time, we'll go back to those questions. Okay. Uh, we will switch tech to uh, take some questions about uh, the research ideas uh, uh, themselves. So, uh, Erwin, uh, I will ask these two questions uh, together because I think they are kind of related. Uh, the, the first is, how, would, how can regular people participate in the design process for sustainability? That's the first question. And the second question is, uh, what are some problems faced when trying to incorporate some of those design ideas that you've introduced uh, into uh, uh, actual uh, real life uh, reality? So, so those are the two questions. Okay, yes, uh, thank you. The first one, uh, I think that how can everyone participate? I think that it's very simple. We can start maybe with ourselves and the things that we do in our everyday. Uh, maybe the simple act of how you turn off or turn, turn on lights, uh, if they're necessary or not necessary. Uh, I think that we have to be conscious that a lot of our lives is actually supported by the energy consumption that we have. And energy consumption is one big part of this sustainable effort also. And even mm. like, for example, the water, the way we use water also, uh, sometimes mm. when we're washing, we just make it run or, so is there a way of uh, doing this? So I think this uh, simple behavioral uh, 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 moves actually would be perhaps one way of uh, contributing to sustainability. And I must add that maybe one of the underpinning uh, ideas about the sustainability in SUTD is the, 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 the need to have a behavioral change in, in order to be sustainable. And so we were referring actually to some Japanese concepts called shikake, mm -hmm. having a device that can trigger maybe some behavioral change. So like when you put something, which sometimes can be very simple, 
uh, it actually would make you react in a certain way. We sometimes don't really observe it closely, but there are certain things that actually would make up uh, the, the world, the environment around us, and it would make us behave in a certain way. A few of the examples that actually came about uh, in the book by Professor Matsumura from Osaka University is like, for example, in Korea, in Seoul, they have the steps in the, the subway uh, actually painted like piano keys. And so you can actually imagine and there will be sounds actually when you're taking on the steps. And so that's one way also maybe of uh, uh, encouraging you to be healthy and then maybe making yourself sustainable. Mm -hmm. And then in the Japanese system also you have, for example, if you go to the garden or if you go to certain places, you would see in front of you a stone and sometimes the stone would have a rope in it. And then normally that would mean that, okay, you cannot go beyond that. So this is something that may be part of the cultural reading. And so I think that in Singapore, these are also uh, uh, present. And so I think that uh, like sustainability is not just about technology and measuring things in, with numbers, but actually a lot to do with human beings and the human behavior. And so the, the human, uh, the scientists from uh, SUTD actually have a lot of work to, to do uh, in this, like for example, some applications being created to uh, maybe uh, see how we behave, uh, like for example, in how we reuse certain things, the Karanguni, an app that actually help people to maybe uh, uh, reuse, recycle, and then create that circularity. So that's uh, maybe a few examples of what can be done. Um, I think that it is, again, similar to studying that it is the will that each of us individually and then the desire that we have that would actually make this possible. So anything can actually be possible. As long as there's a will, there is always a way that we can find to do things. Mm -hmm. uh, on the challenges of this, of course, maybe um, there are, of course, uh, challenges. Uh, and, and, and I think that, again, uh, looking into the challenges and then studying them carefully, and then maybe by looking into them, but in, from different perspectives, we could actually find uh, possible solutions to it. Instead of saying that, ah, it's difficult and then uh, we cannot do it anymore. But actually looking into it uh, square in the eye and then imagining what possibilities could be other than what we have in front of us. So maybe this is uh, one thing. And of course, we have to take a consolation that technology we have also, that we have to maybe uh, be a friend of the technology and then be conscious that, that the technology can actually help us do certain things and, and uh, make certain things possible. So like, for example, perhaps like uh, by having all the data sets, collecting all these data sets, I think that it actually allows us to understand much better the environment around us and then the patterns that actually exist in this and then interpreting these, it allows us to maybe offer possibilities and create scenarios to address this. And so I think AI and machine, le machine learning can actually be useful in this because you can create scenarios, you can create simulation by programming this. But of course, we must always remember that at the very end of the day, it goes back to the person. The person has to make the decision to this. So mm -hmm. the person is always very important in all these sustainability activities. Mm -hmm. So even the reporting of sustainability also, sometimes we think that, okay, we just tick the boxes uh, and and uh, then that's sustainable. I think that it actually sometimes is not very effective because uh, you don't really see that uh, sincerity in doing that uh, drive for sustainability. But I think again, going back to the individual stories of each of us, there is actually something in there. So as a way of reporting, uh, knowing the stories of each of us regarding sustainability could actually be a wonderful way of understanding sustainability and then maybe reporting that, okay, this is what is sustainability mm -hmm. uh, around us. The things that we take for granted, the people that we also don't pay attention to actually maybe are helping uh, in the sustainability. So mm -hmm. I think that one of our colleagues actually, Gordon Tan from Haas is actually, uh, doing a study on how uh, sustainability reporting can be made better. And maybe we have a more distinctive way of reporting from SUTD. Thank you so much, Arvind. There is a question, uh, I guess it's a kind of technical question. It, it asks, uh, 
some people say that building new buildings uh, is much more environmentally harmful than retrofitting existing buildings. Uh, is that true? I mean, what is your view on that? <laughs> uh, technical questions, I'm usually very poor, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I look at it, I was thinking that it's very hard to answer this question. <laughs> yeah. But I think that uh, there are uh, always views also that usually uh, using what you have mm. is actually uh, quite sustainable. And also, I mean, mm. if we look at the circularity of things, it mm. actually helps in the sustainability effort also. Mm. Of course, if you also examined it and then the conclusion is that, okay, taking away what was there and then building something new mm. uh, would be better, then again, you have the pros and cons and then you mm. have to weigh the, the figures mm. that you have. Mm. Um, I would go back again, maybe to Japan itself. Like if I look at the Japanese structures or maybe some of our Asian neighbors also, some of the houses they have, mm -hmm. you can actually take them apart and then assemble them again to actually uh, create something new. So I think that is a very sustainable and mm -hmm. a very circular way of doing things. Mm -hmm. so, so that could be an answer also. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the examples that we have in SUTD is we have the two uh, Chinese heritage houses donated mm. by Jackie Chan, mm. the Ming Dynasty and the Qing Dynasty. And, and I think that they have uh, taken them apart piece by piece and then brought them here and assembled them. And, and then you can see that the, the Ming Dynasty is about 400 years old. And then the Qing Dynasty is about 200 years old. And so uh, they're still there. The, the wood is very uh, uh, in good condition. And then you can see how they were constructed. That The Ming would be very robust, very big columns, big beams, and, and more uh, expansive spaces, while the Qing would be more slender and the space columnation are closer. So there is uh, maybe a, 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 a point to that also that using and reusing, if you can see that things can be reused, why not? And then of course, assessing them that oh, maybe it's not possible to reuse, that's also one point of, of uh, looking at it. So I think that, um, it's, it's not just a one answer itself, but actually looking into the situation uh, case by case and then studying them mm. and then uh, giving the best answer by considering all the parameters that we would have. And then again, I think that technology is very helpful in this because of certain tools that allow us to understand much better certain things that we don't understand. Uh, with our uh, measuring and scanning devices, we could actually scan mm. and and monitor certain things, we would be able to see things that are not seen by the eyes also with, with these, uh, uh, the, the, the scanners and all that. And then it allows us to better understand the situation. So uh, I think that maybe uh, is a way of maybe answering the question. Of course, um, some people like old things and so they treasure very much and then do, uh, uh, do, give new life to these old things. So I think it's very important to give life to them because uh, it creates this continuity and then also this consciousness of where we are. And then it gives an opportunity to imagine also where we could be. I have former students in Japan who now actually uh, have uh, their own uh, construction company. And then they buy up some of the old houses, old uh, structures that are going to be dismantled and then they take them piece by piece and then uh, keep them. And then when they are building a new house, they actually reuse these uh, old pieces. And then so the old becomes the new. And so giving a new life to the old could be something that we could also look into. Mm. Thank you. Uh, another, well, not quite technical, but also <laughs> I think a not an easy question to answer. This question relates to uh, how can we have uh, urban design planning that enhances uh, resilience, but not sacrificing design aesthetics? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't know whether this is actually an either or situation, uh, or is it very difficult to have both? Mm. Uh, I would always say that we can always have both. <laughs> mm. so, uh, if one looks at it, I think that... Uh, uh, the, the, the technical tools that we have, the technological tools, the computation actually can help us, uh, mm. as I mentioned earlier, mm. in understanding the city better. 
And then also maybe uh, projecting certain scenarios for us to mm. imagine how we can make the city better. So I think that that is uh, one consolation perhaps. And, and then mm. also the, the, the people who are doing this are more proactive in, in mm. approaching this. And also maybe that sympathy and then the, the empathy with people also, I think it's also very important. So I think this is also happening in the operation, listening and, and by listening through these uh, uh, conversations, I, I think that certain things that we sometimes take for granted mm. could actually be, uh, be uh, given some life and then can be discovered and then we can do things uh, with this. And then of course, in terms of aesthetics also, I think that it's, it's again a matter of observation and then it is by uh, looking very carefully and then seeing how certain things are actually put together and then actually how the world actually moves. So I think this is one thing that we can learn from Leonardo da Vinci also, that uh, mm. it is by observing the world and how the world works uh, that we can actually imagine mm. beautiful things and then we can do mm. uh, beautiful things. Sometimes like it's just a matter of maybe adjusting certain measurements mm. and having good proportional uh, mm. relationship of the measurements that we can have something beautiful without really adding so many things. Mm. And, and in that way, I think, by having the proper amount of this and that, I think just having enough and not more would actually allow opportunity for creating that sustainable and beautiful world and then maybe happy. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that to be happy, it means that we should not be restraining ourselves that no, you cannot do this. No, you don't do that. Mm -hmm. Because if you're having that, I don't think that you will be happy and then I don't think you'll be sustainable. So I think that you should be doing things that would actually make you happy. Uh, that not restraining yourself, but actually uh, freeing yourself to enjoy certain things, appreciate mm. appreciating certain things and, and beautiful mm. things like good food, <laughs> uh, beautiful uh, mm. flowers and all this and, mm. and understanding how nature works. I think that this uh, would open this opportunity. And uh, yeah, you go ahead. Uh, I mean, sorry. No, no, I, I, I said that it opens the opportunity. Uh. And I think that uh, Again, it's not a work by one person, but a work by everyone. I think that it's again through the conversation. And then it's not really a fight of you against me, but actually mm -hmm. understanding the other side and hopefully the other side also listening to you and understanding where you are. And mm -hmm. then you would come to some sort of a conclusion, mm -hmm. uh, compromise, mm -hmm. or maybe an agreement that, okay, these are things that we can do. And I, I can mm -hmm. see that uh, being done by some of the agencies that actually deal with this uh, matter. Mm -hmm. Because that's really a, a, a very interesting question, right? because I imagine architectural design mm -hmm. would be similar to many kinds of creative uh, uh, activities that we do. So from a totally uh, uh, someone who is not familiar with architecture at all, I would imagine it's that question is almost like asking like a, a fashion designer, when you design a piece of clothes, a uh, piece of dress, do you do you design it to be aesthetically pleasing? Then think about how sustainable and environmentally friendly you can make the dress be uh, through the sources, or you have a piece of material that is organic and that's something, and then you start to think about it. <laughs> I I I don't know what is the thought process. Perhaps people work differently, or mm -hmm. perhaps they can think the two ends as, in, in, at once in, uh, in concert with one another. But uh, I, I'm not sure, it's, it's actually a very interesting uh, question uh, uh, to think about. Uh, so, like I said, you know, in all kinds of creative processes, sometimes we, we start off by imagining the best possible, most aesthetically pleasing thing. Then we work backwards to see how we can, uh, you know, actually create it in a sustainable, uh, possible way. It's, it's like writing a symphony for orchestra as well. You just write and you worry about, can it be played after that? And if it cannot be played, you modify the notes a little bit. I think <laughs> that's how I see it. And I, 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 I suppose uh, your answer is, is uh, about similar as well. You know, you have to take into consideration uh, uh, both uh, 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 factors, you know, whether it is function, functionable, and, and whether it's aesthetically pleasing or not. Uh, we have time for maybe one last question. I think there is a question. Oh, but this question is really, is for LKYC actually. <laughs> I, uh, someone asked a question about 
uh, what opportunities undergrads from other fields have to contribute to LKYC, I see. Uh, perhaps I take this question and, and leave okay. uh, Alvin a, a one minute break. Um, you can visit our website and there we have a full list of current projects that we have. And if you are a student from SUTD, we always welcome student uh, research interns for the holidays. And you can directly write to the uh, principal investigators for whatever project you're interested in. And just ask, you know, whether, you know, there is uh, some space in a project to have an uh, intern to work on the project for the summer holidays, for instance. And we'll get back to you on that. So we don't advertise for internship opportunities, but you can definitely and most welcome to, to write to us to inquire. Okay, so I think the last question, we go back to the one on curriculum again. Uh, I think you kind of uh, answered it broadly. He, he wants to know whether the theme of designing sustainable futures, uh, will, will there be an overlap in current undergraduate courses such as those taught in uh, computer science and design and uh, artificial intelligence AI? Um, I, I think so too, mm. because I think that uh, sustainability is like a horizontal that cuts across all the pillars and then all the clusters also. And then, so the question of what is sustainable, how, how can we be sustainable? Uh, by, by exploring these questions, I think that you're already uh, designing mm. for sustainability itself. Mm. And then uh, as Harvey mentioned that, okay, you can just imagine and then worry later how it is to be put together. Uh, mm. That's one way also. Mm. And then another way also is by learning the, the basics and the fundamentals and then maybe questioning the basics and the fundamentals. So that's mm. also another way of actually uh, doing it. And I think the school, the university actually opens all these possibilities and, and, and it allows you to explore what you can do with what you have. But of course, the question has to be set by you first. And then the, with the question that you have, then you will be able to find the answer. Because if you don't have the question, then how will you find an answer? What answer are you looking for? So when, when you're, uh, maybe some people are already giving the answer, but you have to ask them, what is the question in the first place? So mm -hmm. I think that maybe uh, starting simple mm -hmm. on, on what is sustainability, how we can do sustainability. Uh, mm -hmm. And then perhaps like, for example, in each of the individual disciplines also, there are certain fundamentals mm -hmm. and then uh, areas that are being addressed. So how can mm -hmm. this uh, discipline, particular discipline actually uh, do what it has to do in terms of sustainability. Mm. And I think that collaboration with others uh, is important because we cannot answer the problem by ourselves sometimes alone, mm. but it is actually with the contribution of many people that were able to answer mm. the questions. However, it means that you also have to be sure about yourself and then maybe possess mm. certain fundamentals. And then also again, your own questions in order to be able to contribute mm. to that uh, collaboration and then working together. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have it, I think that it will be very difficult to come to some place or maybe to some mm -hmm. uh, uh, platform for you to be able mm -hmm. to offer something. So again, uh, I would encourage everyone to be curious mm -hmm. and then to be adventurous and then maybe uh, lightheartedly exploratory so that you can find the answers to the questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we are just about time. So I, I wish to thank uh, Professor Irwin Beret again for his time and the uh, very insightful and uh, enriching discussion that we have today. Uh, join us for the next uh, City Pioneers uh, seminar series uh, coming up, I think two months times. <laughs> so uh, thank you for the afternoon with us. Uh, I'll see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you, Irwin. Thank you. Thank you. Take thank care. You, have Professor a good Irwin. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye.